Thank you very much indeed, Barry, for that uh, kind introduction. And it's a complete privilege, I think, to be on the stage with both Kelvin and, and Sir William Cash. I think it's a real strength of our movement that all strands of political uh, opinion are, are shared and coming forward to, to our uh, perspective. A lot of what um, Kelvin talked about, um, I'm going to talk about as well, which is interesting because we do come from different sides of, of the debate, but I recognised an awful lot of what he had to say, and I have to say I agreed with it. So I'm going to talk about in the next 10 or 15 minutes why Britain is going to prosper. But before I do that, I want to nail Project Fear, which I think is the strongest hand the other side have. And if I can get the technology to work, how do we do that? <laughs> That's a shame. Um, what I'm going to show you in a second is Project Fear is effectively about saying you've got to be part of a big club. You've got to be part of a, 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 an organization which has clout that can stand up to China, can stand up to America. Uh, but I'm going to show you a chart, if we can get this technology to work, and it's probably because I pressed the wrong button, uh, which I hope nails. And I think if we can nail that line, long way. Yes, there we are. This is the big mouth. You've got to be large to survive in the world these days. Now, I can probably appreciate this is not the prettiest chart you can ever look at, but what it effectively shows is the population of a country and the GDP of each country. So if it was true that you had to be part of a big club, you'd expect a gently sloping blue line. In other words, the bigger the country, the richer that country is. Now, the 25 largest nations, the richest nations in the world that are in that chart. And the richest ones are Luxembourg, Norway, Qatar, Switzerland. And then Australia, quite a big country. And you come down to America, a big country. There is no correlation whatsoever between the size of a country and its wealth. No correlation. And the second chart there shows all 200-odd countries in the world using IMF data. And the big red lines that spike up are countries with a large population. If anything, there's a, a slight correlation for larger countries to be slightly poorer. So it is nonsense when the CBI and the pro-European lobby say we've got to be part of this big organisation. It's statistically not true in fact. I think it's very important we nail that. The second point is the world is changing extremely rapidly. These two charts show the growth of, of GDP uh, amongst many of the biggest countries in the world uh, since 2005 and since 2009. Those two dates are chosen specifically. 2009 was the onset of the credit crunch. If we take it back to 2005, it shows a slightly happier uh, period when the world is growing more consistently. Over that period, since 2005, China's economy has tripled. You probably can't read the, the data at the back of the room, but the country, you probably can see the colours. The countries in red are in the Eurozone. There's a very strong correlation, both since 2005 and 2009, from low economic growth and being a member of the Eurozone. And the best performing countries have been China, America, Sweden, Ireland has done better than you might expect, actually, Switzerland, Norway, the United Kingdom, and the G10. So the world is changing very fast, but it's changing rapidly away from the European Union. Now, this is a sort of a general chart. I mean, if interest rates globally are close to 0%, uh, percent, it's no great surprise that uh, people take on more debt. But what this chart is showing is that many of the countries that have taken on the most extra debt, not all, but many, are actually European Union members. So not only are they not growing very fast, but they're piling on the debt. Ireland, Portugal, Belgium, Holland, Greece and Spain doing particularly badly in, in, in that regard. And ironically, although I, I would argue that we've probably got too much debt in this country, the UK and US, although uh, have high levels of, of debt, has been growing at a much more slow pace and the consumer and, and corporates have been paying debt down. The increase in UK debts come from government expenditure as it happens. But the bottom line is this that a lot of Europe has been leveraging its balance sheet, particularly Ireland, particularly Portugal, but also you might not expect Belgium and, and Holland in that list. The next point is um, the Eurozone, and this may not go down so well in this room, but I believe it probably has bottomed. I think it's 
unlikely in the short and medium term, and I've argued this for a long time, that the euro is going to collapse. I think Greece is a bit of a red herring, to be quite honest. It's 1.5% of Eurozone GDP. Tragic is the situation uh, is there. But I think there are signs that unemployment, etc., in Europe is starting to fall from very, very high levels. But we'll look at this in a little bit more detail. So I think it would be a mistake for people on our side of the, of the coin to over-egg the pudding. Major problems, yes. Structural problems, yes. Collapse, I think, unlikely. But we could debate that. However, that doesn't mean to say that Europe's doing well. It's not. The degree of unemployment in Europe is uh, extremely concerning. And if we have a look at uh, here, you'll see the differential unemployment in countries like Greece and Spain and Cyprus and Croatia, 20% plus unemployment. And if we were to look at youth unemployment, probably 40%. Not only that, they're exporting people, as, 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 as Kelvin uh, mentioned. Britain's unemployment doing pretty well. Kelvin talked about Germany a lot. German unemployment low as well. But the irony is of this great European project of building the euro, it has actually caused division. It has split Europe apart. That is the total irony of the centralisation that they have adopted. But actually, unemployment as well in Europe is pretty disastrous against any other part zone in the world. Japan has had a recession for 20 years, but Japan's only got 3% unemployed. The Eurozone, about 11%, uh, and, uh, and Britain at 5 US at 4 I would ignore the Chinese figure because I don't believe any statistics they come out with. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, the, the bottom line is this is a European problem. So whether the Eurozone survives or not, I'm happy to debate with you, but what is irrefutable is that the Eurozone has been a social catastrophe in terms of employment. Now, Europe is still very important. I love European civilization, as Kelvin uh, himself uh, alluded to in his, his talk. Uh, but unfortunately, as a continent, uh, uh, the world, as a result of very low growth in the European Union, the significance of Europe is greatly declining. 35% of global GDP in, in the 1980s. The Eurozone is going to be smaller than China by probably, 20, probably next year, actually. Uh, and uh, you're looking at about 14, 15% of global GDP. Of course, it's extremely important that we keep friendly, cordial trading relationships with the Eurozone. It's still a major trading partner. But the world is changing and changing very rapidly. Probably skip over the next slide. Now, um, again, uh, to, to talk about what Kelvin was talking about, the, the huge trade deficit the UK runs uh, with the European Union. We are pretty good at services. We run quite a large surplus in services. Now, and that's with the world, this, this chart here. The red line is our exports, the green line is our imports, and the blue line is the balance. So we're running a fairly large surplus in, in services. That might be educational services, financial services, business services. That includes tourism as well, actually, although we'd run actually a small deficit in tourism. But in trade, there is a problem, and the situation has been getting steadily worse. Now, there is probably a difference of emphasis between the left and the right as to why that problem um, I I exists, and we'll talk about that I in a great second. But as we've also talked about Europe declining in importance, funnily enough, manufacturers, service providers have spotted this. And the European Union is becoming less relevant to them. So the big grow export growth markets have been Russia, China, Brazil, Thailand, South Korea, India, etc. And actually the amount we're continuing to sell to European countries although growing is growing at a much more slow pace, and I think that trend is highly likely to continue. So manufacturers are voting with their feet away from the European Union towards the globe. We can probably skip over this one. This, I think, sums it up quite nicely. Uh, this is the UK's current accounts balance by region. We run quite a big surplus with the world's toughest market, uh, arguably, America. We run a small surplus with Australasia. We actually don't do too badly, a small deficit with Asia and Africa. And actually, that's quite a credible performance with, with Asia when you consider we run a, quite a big deficit with China, given the manufactured goods that we, we import. But this is extraordinary. Uh, the deficit with the European Union has skyrocketed. We've been running a structural deficit, uh, really, for the last 10 years. 
But since 2011, it's increased from about 45 billion to about 100 billion pounds using ONS uh, data. Some of that is cyclical. It's a result of European economies stagnating as the British economy has done better. We've imported and, the, and our export markets have dried up. But a lot of it actually is structural. And this is the nub of the, uh, of, of, of the question, really. First of all, outside the European Union, there is no question in my uh, mind that Britain will continue to enjoy a fantastic trading relationship with Europe because simply it is not in their interest to close the door on British goods, even if they are allowed to do so, and I don't believe them to be so. But we also have to ask, why are we running a deficit like that? Because it isn't all their fault. It's not a very good performance. And I think, actually, the single market itself is flawed. There may be some advantage in the single market in goods, but actually there is no single market in services at all, which is our comparative advantage. I work in the city. You can't just go and sell pension uh, products to, to Germany or France or all sorts of other barriers to trade. And the irony is this, that the Germans can sell cars very easily in the UK, but we cannot sell what we're good at back to, 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 to the European Union. So I think actually the rules are stitched up in a way that are fairly disadvantageous to the United Kingdom. Now, how important is the euro? It was launched and it said it was going to rival the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Well, if you actually look at um, where British companies uh, invoice to, the vast majority, the blue, maybe almost, uh, almost two-thirds is in sterling. The next biggest section uh, is the US dollar. Uh, and that little slither there, the grey section is the euro. It's about 3% of our invoices. So the euro has not only caused unemployment, it's not only lost value on, on the world exchange, but actually it's a pretty irrelevant currency on, 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 glo on global markets. Now, if we look at um, a random overseas country, I looked at Australia, partly because they provide uh, the data, partly because um, I think it's a country a lot of people, uh, their cultural differences are not so different from our own. But in actual fact, in Australian exports, the euro accounts for 0.7% of their invoices. 0.7%. So the bottom line is, the euro is not a big show in, in, in international terms. So what I would like to leave you with the first part of the presentation is that the European Union has been a catastrophe for the people of Europe in terms of providing employment and prosperity for the various nations there. And it's been pretty bad news for Great Britain as well in terms uh, of uh, our exports. Uh, um, and uh, I think it, there may have been a case in the 1960s and 70s when uh, Britain joined the European Union to say we have to, or the common market as then was, that we had to join a, a big, fresh organisation which was growing rapidly. That argument simply doesn't hold water now. Europe is in absolute structural decline and that situation I don't think is going to change. So we have nothing to fear. The second part of this presentation and I, some of these slides we talked about last year but it's just as to remind everyone what a strong position the, the United Kingdom is in as an international country. These slides are absolutely not designed to be chauvinistic and say we're better than them or anything like that at all. But what they, they do show is that we're in a fairly unique position in the United Kingdom. few random stats. The, <coughs> over 50% of all websites in the world are in English. Over 50%. The next is Russian, then German. That's a massive strategic advantage. Not all down to this country, of course. A lot of it's down to America. But that's still a huge strategic advantage. Scientific journals. Before the Second World War... Actually, most scientific journals were written in German. Today, 90% of all academic journals in science are published in English. A huge strategic advantage, nothing to do with the European Union, and that advantage will continue. Education. At the elite level, Britain punches well beyond its weight. And since I talked last year, the situation's got marginally better. Actually, the Anglosphere um, dominates... Probably two-thirds of the top 200 universities come from the Anglosphere generally, but Britain comes out very credibly in second place. One of the global ten most prestigious universities, America's got seven, the UK's got three, and uh, 
no one else has got any. Uh, <laughs> and in, the, in, uh, in terms of Europe, actually the Eurozone can muster one in, 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 in Germany. So, you know, it, from an educational perspective, uh, Britain holds its own. And I notice British universities are saying we've got to remain in the U European Union to, to prosper. I, I, I just think they completely miss the arguments as to what uh, has caused the academic excellence at many of our, our top institutions. So the EU hasn't made our universities great, and leaving it will not change that, that situation. Um, <laughs> I can't personally recall voting for President Juncker, maybe I, I, I did, but uh, um, this is ultimately, as uh, previous speakers have talked about, uh, is about governance, it, it is about sovereignty, it's about kicking the other law out if you don't like them very much. Now, um, many European countries have pretty stable traditions, some also less so, but uh, you know, we've done pretty well over the years in terms of the rule of law, I think the common law approach has a lot to, to recommend it based on, on, on precedent. I, I think there's a major threat to our system of government through corpus juris. We won't talk about that today because it's a subject in it itself. But we have had, and you can see this for good or ill from the, the migration flows into the UK, one of the reasons is the stability of, of this country. And I, I think that is a major, major issue. I think that stability is under grave threat. And, you know, I, I find it a little nauseous when <laughs> yeah, when European uh, politicians sort of lecture North Africa and elsewhere on, on democracy. I think it's a little bit rich, really. Um, we all know that London is the world's global capital. It, it, it held that title to the 1920s, 1930s, probably lost it to New York. There are only two cities in the world that can contend. We have one of them here, uh, and it's an incredibly vibrant place. That continues whether we're a member of the European Union or, or not. Um, there's a big debate raging in the city. Um, uh, a number of the, the big investment banks don't take our perspective, and we shouldn't kid ourselves about that. But quite a lot of practitioners do take our, uh, our perspective, particularly amongst the the middle-sized um, uh, uh, and some larger institutions, the very biggest institutions tend to be global, uh, Deutsche Bank or Credit Suisse or JP Morgan, etc. They're not British-run <laughs> businesses. But uh, I, I firmly believe that the threat to the city uh, comes from, from regulation, actually, uh, and it, it, it doesn't come from, from, from leaving the European Union. That's a debate we've got to win, I, I think. I think uh, there are people who take a different perspective on that, but I, I think that they are um, somewhat misguided. British assets are global. Majority are outside the European Union. Ironically, the ones in the European Union have had a pretty low rate of return of late, and that percentage is, if anything, going down. And uh, thankfully, the Scots had enough common sense. It wasn't obvious when I spoke last year, but did just about vote no. So we're still quite strong in oil. Uh, and that's quite important. We, the UK produces, uh, even at this low oil price, more than 50% of the entire EU's production uh, of, of oil. Defence and security. Uh, there's only one show in the world. That's America. But uh, actually, in a European context, there's, re there's, there's two significant powers, the UK and France. The other forces are either really homeland forces or pretty tokenistic. Uh, if the UK leaves the European Union, that's a serious, serious blow to, to Europe's pretenses in, in the military field. And while I might argue that our conventional forces are possibly too small, I think we should remember that uh, the UK's position is quite multifaceted. Uh, in defence, it is uh, it's about special forces, it, it is about membership of the UN um, Security Council, it's about intelligence gathering, it, it's about strategic assets. Cyprus as a listening station is pretty, pretty uh, important. Uh, and um, although diminished, we still have quite a strong um, diplomatic heritage. So I'm a little perplexed by um, President Obama 
Hitler's attitude. I think there's a lot of politics going on here. But the, the reality is uh, the UK, over a long period of time, has shown itself to be um, uh, America's best ally. And I think we should also be Europe's best ally as well, by the way, uh, just not within the, the confines of the European Union. But I think we knock ourselves down a bit on our, our, our hard power assets. Um, there's probably a range of views in this hall on the, the, the British aid budget. Um, but it is a fact that Britain spends the second most of any country on earth on foreign aid. We could debate quite honourably whether it's well spent or not. Uh, I probably agree with that. But uh, um, the bottom line is this. For, you know, for people who take a possibly a different political perspective to ourselves, I think this is quite important, particularly with a, with a younger vote as, as well. Britain plays its full share in a global context as a, as a full paid-up citizen of the world. That there is little doubt. An actual fact, that $17.8 billion underestimates the situation because that's the money that government spends and it ignores any charity that people like yourselves might choose to give through Oxfam or whoever it might, might happen to be. Um, soft power. Soft power is the access of everything that's not military. It's culture, enterprise, engagement, education and government. Uh, and it's debatable, but, you know, survey after survey puts Britain out, if not first, in the top two or three, along with Germany, America, perhaps, France. Uh, and that's nothing to do with the European Union. These are assets that the UK has had for a very, very long period of, of time, and I think would be probably enhanced if, if we left uh, the European Union. So what I'm trying to do is just... I think one of the, our greatest enemy is, is fear... And I know that I think most people in this room don't have that fear, but some of our, our, our friends might. And I just think that that fear is misplaced because in so many aspects, the UK is a, in an extremely strong leadership position uh, in, in, in the world. And uh, I put this up last year. Um, if we leave the European Union, uh, we're hardly isolated. We're still a member of 96 international organisations. Uh, I might argue some of them we probably shouldn't be a member of, but it's quite another issue. Uh, and some of them are very important. WTO, for example, that's the World Health Organization, but the, the w, yeah, w Trade Organization would get our vote back, for example. So there would be an enhancement of power in some, some areas. But that's a fairly unique <coughs> excuse me, uh, set, set of organizations. So we are not isolated. It, it's just, just nonsense. So to conclude... I think if Britain does leave the European Union, I have to say I think the probability of that happening is increasing, and I think we shouldn't be complacent, but I think we've got a very good sporting chance. I mean, I look at Odds Checker, the betting aggregator website, and 12 months ago they gave a 10% chance of Britain leaving the European Union. That's the hard money. That's where the, that's where the, forget the opinion polls. That's so where the money, follow the money, not the opinion polls. Uh, they now say it's about a 32% chance. So still less than 50% is where the money is, but that's a substantial shift uh, of opinion. So absolutely all to play for. But I'll tell you this, if Britain does leave, Europe's got a much bigger, the European Union's got a much bigger problem uh, that, that, than we have got. And I think actually it would result in one of two things, either probably total federalisation or perhaps the fracturing of, of the project uh, completely. But uh, it would become a very dynamic situation, and I think the status quo would not, would not survive. I hope I've shown that um, Britain's got world-leading uh, cultural, educational, business, trading, and hard and soft power uh, assets. We have absolutely nothing uh, to fear. I think, you know, you, the European Union is a centralising tendency. It's McDonaldization of Europe taking the, the, the diverse... Um, uh, cultures of Europe and trying to harmonise them into some sort of sort of pale blue zombicised man has been an absolute catastrophe. The euro has been a, a, a disaster, uh, despite many senior business figures and politicians uh, suggesting we should join. Common agricultural policy, uh, I think, has been pretty disastrous. The environmental policies hardly work. Fisheries has not worked. Uh, health and safety is burdensome. Trade with Africa, um, I think, is highly prejudicial against African growth. And, you know, what? not one of these areas has David Cameron tried to renegotiate. 
you know, I, I think his renegotiation is frankly a joke. Uh, uh, But, you know, luckily, I, he's got, had quite a hard time of it in the press, so I think people are, are seeing through it. And I think our best chance of winning is to nail that, that joke and make it very clear that he's trying to pull the wool over everyone's eyes again. Um, the much-vaunted single market has possibly some advantages in the trade of goods, but actually, in what we're good at, it doesn't work. There is no single market. So, you know, frankly, I think we've got absolutely nothing to fear but fear itself. I think the UK punches below its weight uh, as a member of the European Union. I think as a country, we'll get our mojo back again when we leave. Thank you. Thank you.